All right, well, good morning. We're going to go ahead and, and get started with our, our Sunday school hour this morning. We are continuing in a survey of systematic theology. So um, this is another part in the study of ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church. And uh, I apologize to you visual learners out there. Um, there will not be a PowerPoint this morning. Uh, PowerPoint and I are, are just not good friends at the moment. Um, so we'll do this the old-fashioned way. Um, but before we get into our study together, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask his blessing on our time in the Word. Our Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, this morning I am I'm excited and, and thankful to be uh, together with, with your people, um, looking into these rich and beautiful and powerful truths around uh, the ordinances you've given to your church of, of baptism and of the Lord's Supper. I pray that um, you would give us clarity of thought and understanding that your Holy Spirit would, uh, would teach uh, the word to us and apply it to our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this morning we are looking at the ordinances of uh, baptism and of the Lord's Supper. So in reference to baptism and the Lord's Supper, we generally prefer to use the term ordinances rather than sacraments, uh, believing it to be a more precise descriptor for these, uh, since these observances were ordained by Christ. They were given to the church by him. Um, but also so as to avoid any confusion or association with the Roman Catholic sacramental view of baptism and the Eucharist as being some, some sort of holy action with the power to free from sin and that they work apart from the faith of, of those who participate in them. Um, so we don't want to be associated with that view. And while we affirm that the Christian's observance of the ordinances of baptism and of the Lord's Supper is a matter of, of obedience and great blessing. They are not salvific in nature. They bring great blessing and they benefit the believer's life, but they cannot bring salvation to the unregenerate. Only faith in Christ can do that. Well, so the first of these ordinances we'll look at this morning is the ordinance of baptism. So in, uh, in recent years... Baptism, its true meaning, the correct mode, and the proper application has been a hot topic of debate in the church. And by recent years, I mean about the past 600 years or so. Um, so basically, from the time that Luther drove a nail through his paper into the door of the All Saints Church, it kicked off a controversy uh, that has continued to this day. So even among sincere, like-minded believers, this can be a point of, of contention, a point of debate. And the temptation for us might be when approaching a, a topic that the church has really struggled to find consensus on uh, for most of its history, might be for us to, to throw up our hands and say, what's the point? If the church's greatest theological minds have not, have not been able to uh, come together on this, then, then how are we going to figure it out? Um, but the historical difficulty of a doctrine does not excuse us from our calling as disciples of Jesus to faithfully and carefully study and prayerfully seek to understand all that he has taught us. This includes baptism and the Lord's Supper. So in our study, our commitment must be not to tradition or to preconception, or to what we are comfortable with, but to the scriptures alone. Right doctrine can and must be rooted and grounded in the word. So if you and I are sincerely committed this morning to the task of seeking out sound doctrine from the scriptures alone, then we must come in humility, with open hands, ready to have our understanding refined, uh, perhaps corrected, perhaps confirmed. So what do the scriptures teach us about baptism? So we will examine this ordinance from four different perspectives this morning. First, uh, we're going to look at the mode of baptism, how it is done. Second, we will look at the recipients of baptism, who it is for. 
Third, we will look at the necessity of baptism, why it is done. And fourthly, we will look at the significance of baptism and what does it mean. So first, as we consider the, the mode of baptism from a biblical perspective, how is it to be done? Uh, the position of Redemption Hills Church leadership is that the overwhelming evidence in the New Testament points to baptism happening in one way. That the person being baptized was immersed, put completely underwater, and then brought back up again. So why do we hold this? Firstly, um, the first evidence that we see of this is in the biblical word usage. Uh, the word for baptism found throughout the New Testament, baptizo, means to plunge, to immerse. Literally, it's uh, to, to dunk or to dip. In the other Greek literature written around the same time as the New Testament, it can be helpful to see how this word is, is used. Um, in some works, we see it used to describe a, a ship that sinks beneath the waves. It's a, it's a baptized ship. Uh, it can also be used of a besieged city which uh, falls to its enemies and is um, plunged or baptized into chaos. We also see the word uh, used significantly to describe someone who has died and been buried in the earth. They are said to be baptized in the ground. So the New Testament writers, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chose their words very carefully. And the meaning of the word baptizo is to immerse. Secondly, we see immersion um, as the clear sense that is given by many specific details in the Gospels regarding baptism. Uh, we'll cover just a few of these. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 5, uh, it says that be, people were being baptized, uh, the, the Greek word is en, or in the river Jordan, not, not beside or by or near the river, but in it. Also, we see uh, in Mark's gospel how Jesus is said at his baptism to have come ek, or out of the water, not that he came away from it. Um, in John chapter 3, verse 23, we're told that John was baptizing in a, in a certain part of the Jordan River because there was much water there, we're told. So much water, it's unlikely that this refers to the breadth or the width of the river, um, but to its depth. And depth of water could be important to only one mode of baptism, immersion. Thirdly, um, we see baptism by immersion in the New Testament is, is crucial to its um, primary symbolism uh, that, we, that we are given of the ordinance, and it is that of a believer's union with Christ and incorporation into his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, we read, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So we can see um, by these three evidences how baptism by immersion uh, as the believer is, is plunged into and then raised up out of the water, clearly and beautifully, significantly pictures our incorporation into Jesus' death and our experiencing the power of his resurrection as we are raised with him to newness of life. This is a rich symbolism, and that is um, unfortunately missed in part by other modes of baptism. So secondly, we're going to look at the recipients of baptism. Who is it for? The clear teaching of scripture is that only those who have a testimony of saving faith in Christ and whose life gives evidence to the truth of that testimony are to be baptized. 
We call this view uh, believer's baptism. Uh, and it is sometimes referred to as a baptistic view. Baptism is a symbol of the believer's incorporation into Christ through faith. It is a sign which actually signals the beginning of the believer's new life in Christ. Therefore, it is appropriately administered only to those who have, in fact, begun that new life in Christ through faith. Um, so some biblical proof texts that we could present for believers, the believer's baptism view um, are found in, uh, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, we see where after Peter's sermon at Pentecost, uh, we read, those who received his word were baptized. Then in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, when Philip is preaching the gospel in Samaria, it says, when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Um, and in Acts chapter 10, verse 47 through 48, as pre Peter is, is preaching to the Gentiles in Cornelius' household, and they respond in faith, he says, Can anyone forbid water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So these passages, along with, with many, many others that we don't have time to get into this morning, um, show that baptism is a sign that is for those who have received the gospel and responded in faith, trusting Christ as their Savior. It is exclusive to those who are in Christ and who belong to the community of, community of faith that is the church. So the answer to our question this morning of who is to be baptized, who is it for, is that baptism, the sign of regeneration, is for the regenerate. Uh, next, we are going to look at the necessity of baptism, or why do, we, why do we baptize? And so here's the answer. It's really complicated. You ready for it? Because Jesus said to. Matthew 28, verse 19, our Lord says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We are of those nations he sent his followers out to disciple. And his, his commandment is that we should be baptized and that those we disciple should be baptized. The necessity of baptism for the church comes from this commandment of Christ. He is ordained that for the obedient believer, the testimony and the sign of water baptism accompany the spirit baptism that is conversion. So while it is right that we affirm that baptism is, is necessary as an act of obedience to Christ, we must be careful not to say that baptism is necessary for salvation. Uh, to do so is as much as to say that we are not justified by faith alone. Um, so this would actually be the, the Roman Catholic sacramental view uh, of baptism, that it is uh, necessary to salvation and even that it could affect salvation. The Catholic doctrine teaches that um, uh, at, at a Catholic infant's christening, uh, that baptism by a priest actually gives spiritual life to that infant, and we would uh, reject that doctrine. So the best illustration of this that, that we can see um, would be perhaps in Jesus' words to, to the thief on the cross in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, where he says, Today you will be with me in paradise. So this thief on the cross, after confessing Jesus as Lord, and after crying out to him for his mercy, could do nothing else but die. He was definitely not baptized, but was he saved? The answer is yes, he was. He was saved. He was in the presence of Christ in heaven. Baptism, bat, baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it is necessary if we are to be obedient to Christ. 
Uh, so next we're going to look at the significance of baptism. We have, uh, we've talked about the mode of baptism and the necessity, and now what does it mean? What is its significance? Um, we see the, that the ordinance of baptism in the New Testament is presented as both a testimony and as an illustration. Firstly, it is a, it is a testimony of submission to God's will for the life of the believer. Now, this is kind of illustrated negatively uh, in a very interesting passage in Luke chapter 7, verse 30, where, uh, where the gospel, gospel writer tells us that the evidence that the Pharisees and the lawyers uh, had rejected God's purpose for their life was that they would not be baptized. They would not be baptized because they were not submitted to God's purpose for their life. But we also see the greatest positive example of this uh, in Jesus' life at his baptism that was both a testimony of his submission to the Father's purpose as he sets an example for us in that submission. And it was an illustration of his coming death, burial, and resurrection. Our baptism as well is a testimony of submission to Christ, and it is a powerful illustration of what takes place in the life of a believer at conversion, when through faith we are baptized by the Holy Spirit and united with Christ so that by his death we die to sin and by his resurrection we can be made alive to God. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the, the essential significance of baptism that these passages in Colossians and in Romans point to is that it testifies to and illustrates in a profound and beautiful way our incorporation into Christ through faith and our union with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And this, this union with Christ that sets us free from sin to serve him. So I, I hope that as we, are, as we are considering these things, as we're studying these things, um, that we can, even now, just give thanks to God for the beautiful truth uh, that is here. Wayne Grudem writes, What then is the meaning of baptism? In all the discussion over the mode of baptism and the disputes over its meaning, it is easy for Christians to lose sight of the significance and the beauty of baptism and to disregard the tremendous blessing that accompanies this ceremony. The amazing truths of dying and rising with Christ and of having our sins washed away are truths of a momentous and eternal proportion and ought to be an occasion for giving great glory and praise to God. So uh, we're going to, we're going to shift gears now and look at the second ordinance we we're considering this morning, and that is the Lord's Supper. So unlike baptism that is uh, designed to be experienced once by a believer at conversion, uh, Jesus told his followers that the meal of remembrance we call the Lord's Supper should be observed regularly. By design, Christ has made it so that the church and the individual believer needs to experience and to benefit from this observance of the Lord's Supper again and again and again and again throughout their life. Um, so we see, we see the, uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper in two key passages. The first is Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. Uh, feel free to go ahead and turn there, and we'll read it together. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Um, as well, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 25, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Uh, we see, in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, uh, throughout the church's history, there have been some differing exegetical views of, of the significance of the meaning of the Lord's Supper. And so, this morning, we're going to look at the four main views or interpretations of this ordinance. And they are, uh, first, what would be the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation. Uh, secondly, the Lutheran view of consubstantiation. And then we will consider the memorial view that was put forward by uh, Pastor Ulrich Zwingli uh, in the, uh, at the beginning of the Reformation. And the emphasis is on the Lord's Supper as um, a memorial celebration of his atonement. And then lastly, we will look briefly at the Calvinist or Reform view, which emphasizes Christ's spiritual presence uh, in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. So the Roman Catholic view um, that is termed transubstantiation has been held um, formally since the early 12th century when it was first um, articulated and termed transubstantiation, recognized as doctrine at the Fourth Council of the Lateran. Um, and essentially, its dogma teaches that when the elements of the bread and the cup are blessed by the priest, that they are somehow mystically transformed into the actual physical body and blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, so there are some problems with this. Um, apart from being hermeneutically ridiculous and that it completely fails to recognize the symbolic nature of Jesus' statement that this is my body, um, the critical issue here is that the, the, this view, this Roman Catholic view, devalues and undermines the work of Jesus on the cross as a once-for-all atoning sacrifice, um, where in this view, instead, his propitiatory sacrifice must happen over and over and over again. So some scriptures that clearly contradict this, this re-sacrificing of Jesus are Romans chapter 6 and verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. So Christ being offered once to bear the sins of many. Now another critical error with this view is that the congregant's participation in the Lord's Supper, or, or the Eucharist, as it is called, is seen as being salvific in nature, that the mere act of eating and drinking of the body and blood somehow has the power to remove sin. Uh, so the next view that we're going to look at is, is the Lutheran view, or what is termed consubstantiation. So in the early 16th century, Martin Luther uh, comes along, and as he is seeking to reform the church's doctrine, he recognized these issues um, in the Catholic uh, Eucharist, and he rejected the idea of it as being a propitiatory sacrifice. Um, he rejects transubstantiation, the teaching that the bread and the cup literally become Jesus' body and blood, but he still holds on to the idea that Christ's body and blood are actually present uh, and the term is in, with, and under these elements. So according to Luther, the bread and the wine now don't become the actual body and blood of Christ, but they accompany them in a, an invisible but actual sense. So um, this is a vast improvement on the Catholic view, but uh, still perhaps not, not quite there. So we have 
Uh, we've looked at this Catholic view and the Lutheran view. Next, um, we'll consider what is called the memorial view. Um, so around this same time that Luther was reforming the church, uh, another church reformer and a contemporary of Martin Luther's, um, a Swiss pastor named Ulrich Zwingli, uh, he is teaching and he affirms and upholds the sufficiency of Jesus once for all atonement on the cross. He rejects any notion of the Lord's Supper as being um, a continuing sacrifice or being a propitiatory sacrifice with the power to absolve from sins. And uh, Zwingli puts forward his, uh, his exegesis and his interpretation of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper as being a uh, memorial celebration of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for sins. Now, this is consistent with what we see in the scriptures where in 1 Corinthians 11, Jesus' uh, stated intent was to do this in remembrance of me. Um, and so, shortly thereafter, um, John Calvin uh, is teaching on this. And while he was perhaps influenced by the, uh, the Zwinglian uh, view, um, he goes beyond um, and sees in the Lord's Supper um, a memorial, yes, but he also emphasizes the, the spiritual presence of Christ with his church in a special way that takes place during the Lord's Supper. So while we as a church would assert that the Roman Catholic tradition uh, heretic, heretically promotes a works-based salvation, and that the Lutheran view, while not heretical, is hermeneutically in error. Uh, both the Zwinglian memorial view and the Calvinistic reformed view uh, are biblically based and are not necessarily incompatible. Sincere, like-minded believers may hold to each of these views to varying degrees and still be uh, orthodox, orthodox, still hold right doctrine, since it is true that the Lord's Supper was given by Jesus to his church as a memorial celebration. And it is also true that the special presence of Christ with his church, which is always a reality, may be experienced more keenly by the believer through the powerful reminder that is the Lord's Supper. Uh, MacArthur and Mayhew in their book, Bible Doctrine, sum it up this way. The Lord's Supper is best understood as a memorial celebration that strengthens believers in their walk with Christ because it commemorates Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice, reminds believers of the truths of the gospel, prompts believers to repent of any known sin, causes them to rejoice in their redemption from sin and union with Christ, and it motivates them to hope in his imminent return. So this ordinance is a powerful event with incredible depth of meaning and enormous benefits and blessings for the church. So I want us to, to uh, in these last few minutes, kind of zoom in and exa examine seven different aspects or seven different layers of significance and meaning that we can see in the Lord's Supper. Um, and these are pointed out by Wayne Grudem in his book, Bible Doctrine. First, we see that the Lord's Supper depicts Jesus' death. So when we as the church take part in the, the ceremony of this meal, our very actions of stepping forward and taking the bread and, a, and the cup um, and eating and drinking illustrate the death of our Lord Jesus for us. The breaking of the bread pictures the breaking of Jesus' body. The pouring out of the cup symbolizes the pouring out of his blood for us. So by our participation in this, we are in a sense preaching or proclaiming the death of our Lord Jesus Christ by this, this illustration. And he said in 1 Corinthians 11, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the Lord's Supper depicts, illustrates, it proclaims his death. It also pictures for us our participation 
in the benefits of Jesus' death. He told his disciples, take, eat, this is my body. So as we obey that commandment, as we come to the Lord's table and as we reach out and take a piece of the bread and take a cup for ourselves, we are saying by that action, I am appropriating this for myself. I am taking for me the benefits of Jesus' death. By actively stepping forward to receive this provision of Jesus' body and blood, we are declaring that we are, we are fully taking our share in the blessings that he has earned for us by his atoning sacrifice. Thirdly, we see that uh, the Lord's Supper provides us spiritual nourishment. So just like uh, physical food, uh, bread and wine or juice, quite literally sustain and nourish our physical bodies, giving us life, satisfying our hunger and our thirst, so does this observance of the Lord's Supper by rehearsing and reminding us of these truths of the gospel. Uh, nourish and strengthen our spiritual life. This is the point. This is, this is why the whole event of this meal has been designed was to teach us this truth. Um, Jesus spoke of this in John chapter 6, verses 53 through 57, where he says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. What a vivid expression of this truth that our participation in the Lord's Supper is nourishing to our spiritual life as our participation in his death, burial, and resurrection through faith in him gives to us spiritual life. Um, fourthly, the Lord's Supper uh, is a profound illustration of the unity of the believers. So when we as a church take part together in the Lord's Supper, we are showing our unity with one another. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So next we see that the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is a blessing to the believer because it is an affirmation of Jesus' love for, for us, of Jesus' love for me. Um, the fact that I am able to participate in the Lord's table, the fact that you are able to participate in the Lord's table if you are in Christ through faith, the truth that he invites us to come is a vivid reminder, one that we can see and we can touch, that Jesus Christ loves me, that Jesus Christ loves you. He calls you to this supper, and he says of his sacrifice through this picture, this is for you. Another blessing that we have in this ordinance is that Christ affirms for us through the Lord's Supper, that all of the blessings of salvation are reserved for us. Um, Wayne Grudem writes this, I come at Christ's invitation to the Lord's Supper. The fact that he has invited me into his presence assures me that he has abundant blessings for me. In this supper, I am actually eating and drinking at a foretaste of the great banquet table of the king. 
I come to his table as a member of his eternal family. And when the Lord welcomes me to his table, he assures me that he will welcome me to all the other blessings of earth and heaven as well, and especially to the great marriage supper of the Lamb, at which a place has been reserved for me. Lastly, uh, we see that in the Lord's Supper, the believer affirms their faith in Christ. So with each time that I partake of this ordinance, that I partake of the Lord's Supper, as I take the bread and the cup, and as I eat and I drink, I, I am proclaiming, we are proclaiming, both individually and corporately, Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Your church trusts in you. We are proclaiming by eating and drinking that I need the forgiveness and the cleansing of sin that can only come through the propitiation of your death, Lord Jesus, on the cross in my place. It is only because of your broken body and your blood poured out that I have hope of salvation. Jesus, thank you. Um, so there are many more aspects and layers and so much more depth to both of these ordinances, um, but that will be the end of our study for this morning, and if it has whet your appetite to, to just revel and to glory in these truths, I would encourage you to, to just dive into the word and see them for yourself this week. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and close in prayer, and you'll be dismissed. Our Father, this morning we thank you and we bless you and we praise your name for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his gracious provision for his church through these ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And I pray that uh, this morning we would in some measure have, have grown in our, in our understanding and appreciation of them. Uh, may they never grow old or rote to us, but that we would constantly um, see more truth and more beauty uh, unveiled uh, in, these, in these provisions that you have given to your church, in these uh, testimonies and illustrations of uh, the grace that is in Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. You can be dismissed.